Greetings, everyone. I'm Dan Murphy. I'm executive director of the Mossover Romani Center for Business and Government at the Harvard Kennedy School. And I'm pleased to introduce today's event, which will explore the dynamics around China's vast corruption paired with an economic boon and an authoritarian governance structure. Our speakers for today First is Professor Yuan Yuan Ang. She is a professor of politics at University of Michigan. And Mr. Patrick Akibo III, who is the founder of Next Year. Now, Yuan's book, China's Gilded Age, has ignited a conversation about the nature of corruption and economic development in China that has changed the way that we think about those topics. She has received numerous awards for her writing as a scholar, but is also someone who has spoken to broad audiences, both through her writing and commentary in places like the New York Times, Foreign Affairs, and Project Syndicate, and through her speaking engagements to both academics, the business community, and others across the globe. So we're very pleased to welcome her today and to hear more about her work. Uh, Professor Ang will speak for about 25 minutes and then turn the floor over to Patrick. I'm proud to note that Patrick is a senior fellow at the Masavur Romani Center for Business and Government. He started his career uh, with Diamond Bank before moving on to other positions in Accenture and Citigroup, which he left as vice president in 2007 to join Transcorp as its chief financial officer. He has also served as a senior advisor to the president of Nigeria, focusing on reforming the country's electricity sector. He sits on the board of, or is an advisor of many important global initiatives, too many to list here. Uh, but I will say that he is also a trusted advisor to many public officials. I think one of the things that uh, uh, bring, makes this event somewhat unique is we will be hearing from experts who are close and informed advisor, uh, observers of both China and Nigeria to explore issues of corruption, the economy, and governance. Uh, once Yuan has finished her presentation, we will hear commentary, questions, and insights from Patrick before opening things to audience Q&A. For those in the audience, please feel free to put your questions in the question and uh, in the in the in the chat box as the event goes on, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible before the conclusion of the event. With that, Yuan, I, I thank you. I welcome you, Patrick. I thank you and welcome you. And I turn the floor over to you, Yuan. Thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure and a real honor to speak at Harvard. Um, I've had the pleasure of in, in of indirectly interacting uh, with Patrick. Uh, the think tank that he founded next year reviewed uh, my book, China's Gilded Age. Um, as I told Dan, it's quite rare to see a conversation between an observer of China and observer of Nigeria. So I'm really delighted to be part of this conversation and hope there will be more of it. Now, for the benefit of those who may not have uh, read my book, I'd like to start with a brief overview of the key arguments in my book. So allow me to share my screen. Good. Okay, wonderful. So today I'm going to talk about a big question. Does corruption really disappear as countries grow richer? And according to the conventional wisdom, the answer to this question is yes. And one prominent example is Professor Samuel Huntington's Political Order in Changing Societies, in which he offers a life cycle theory of corruption. According to Huntington, corruption rises steeply during initial stages of modernization and then falls as countries grow richer and acquire state capabilities. This theory seems to be, have, seems to be borne out in the experience of 
18th century England and 19th century United States. As one indicator, this figure here shows media coverage of corruption in a bundle of US newspapers from 1873 to 1942. You can see that the US used to have a serious corruption problem. It peaked in the 1870s during the scandal-ridden Grant administration, rose slightly again during the Gilded Age, but declined steadily afterward, lasting all the way to World War II. So if media coverage of corruption is a valid indicator, this proves that Professor Huntington's life cycle theory is correct. Corruption declines as countries grow richer. If we believe proposition number one, this then takes us to a second piece of conventional wisdom about corruption. Corruption is found in poor countries, whilst rich countries are clean. The most common measure of corruption is the Corruption Perception Index, or CPI, published by Transparency International every year. It ranks countries on their perceived levels of corruption ranging from 0 to 100. Study after study finds that rich countries are clean, whereas the poor are corrupt. The Annual Review of Political Science reports an extremely robust relationship between corruption and low levels of GDP. So, if you believe one, and you also believe two, then naturally it takes you to the third proposition. How strange it is that rampant corruption and economic boom coexist in China. My book is dedicated to debunking all three myths. And in the rest of the presentation, I'll walk you through each one of them. So let's begin by unbundling the the concept of corruption itself. Now, normally people think of corruption as a one-dimensional problem, rated from zero to 100. This approach is misleading. It obscures the fact that corruption comes in qualitatively different types that cannot be reduced into a single score. To unbundle corruption, I offer a simple four-part typology divided along two dimensions. The first dimension is whether corruption involves elites or non-elites. For example, the president and his family or street level police officers. The second dimension is whether corruption involves exchange or theft. The intersection of the two dimensions creates four categories of corruption. First, petty theft, such as extortion. Second, grand theft, such as embezzlement. Third, speed money, petty bribes paid to low-level officials to overcome red tape and delays. And then finally, access money, which is not the same as speed money. Access money are lavish perks paid to powerful officials, not just for speed, but for exclusive lucrative access. For example, cheap land, government contracts, lax regulations, tax breaks. Unlike speed money, access money can be legal and institutionalized. And in developing countries like China, such corruption is still illegal and personal, manifesting in the form of massive bribes. Here's another way to understand the distinction. Speed money are bribes derived from blocking and hindering businesses whereas access money are rewards collected by helping selected businesses make enormous profit that they otherwise could not without the government's help. If speed money is a tax, then access money from the pay's point of view is an investment with expectations of significant returns. Like drugs, different types of corruption harm in different ways. Petty theft and grand theft are equivalent to toxic drugs. They are the most damaging and have absolutely no benefit as they drain public and private wealth. Speed money is not as bad as petty and grand theft, 
but it does not spur growth. You can think of it as painkillers. It lessens headaches, but it does not help you grow muscles. Excess money, on the other hand, are the steroids of capitalism. Steroids are known as growth enhancing drugs, but such drugs come with serious side effects that accumulate over time. Historically, we have seen the side effects play out in settings around the world. Crony capitalism and state capture contributed to the financial crashes in 19th century America, of which there were five. The Asian financial crisis in 1997 and most recently the 2008 US financial crisis. Such a crisis has begun to surface in China as seen in the case of Evergrande, the second largest real estate developer on the brink of bankruptcy. When my book first came out in 2020, nobody knew or cared about China's Gilded Age. But a year later in 2021, China's Gilded Age suddenly became a vogue phrase, appearing in The Economist, The Financial Times, The New York Times, and many other outlets. So now that we've unbundled corruption, we have the concepts and vocabulary to revisit the two conventional wisdoms I earlier described. So first, let's think about, does corruption really disappear as countries grow richer? Let's revisit the American evolutionary path. Now, during the progressive era, the American government carried out sweeping social, political, and economic reforms. Some of the most significant reforms include replacing the sports system with a professional salaried public administration, introducing transparency in public accounts to prevent abuses of public funds. But by the end, therefore, by the end of the progressive era, as one historian noted, the most striking aspect of embezzlement is how little it occurred. All of this is consistent with the impression that as countries grow richer, corruption disappears. However, if you extend the timeline and look beneath the hood, things get more complicated. During the later part of the 20th century, capitalists and politicians found creative ways to get around campaigns finance restrictions, for example, by setting up political action committees. Between 1998 and 2020, lobbying expenditures more than doubled. Now, to be sure, lobbying is not corruption. Lobbying is a legal activity, and indeed, it is a form of democratic representation. The problem with lobbying is that the playing field is far from even, and it can have distorting effects. For example, the U.S. Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission concluded in 2011 that from 1990 to 2008, the financial sector expended $2.7 billion in federal lobbying. Individuals and PACs made more than $1 billion in contributions. Another study finds that lenders who lobbied more, took more risk, faced higher delinquency rates, and were more likely to be bailed out. Some legal scholars have applied the term undue influence, meaning a distortion of political outcomes as the result of the undue influence of wealth. In other words, in the US, media coverage of corruption declined, not because corruption disappeared in fact, but because it changed in form and was no longer called corruption. It became hard to pin down at what point lobbying and democratic representation became influence paddling. Indeed, I would argue that there may be a historical pattern across capitalist economies. Corruption changes in quality, from thuggery and theft to an excess money. And as countries get richer, that excess money evolves toward increasingly legal, ambiguous, and sophisticated forms. Having revised our understanding of the historical evolution of corruption, we can now revisit the second proposition, whether corruption is a problem that exists only in poor countries. Remember this annual review of political science article 
It claims that the correlation between GDP levels and perceived corruption is extremely robust. The author carried out a variety of robustness tests, including the Atwood Learner's extreme bound analysis. Such a robust analysis, however, misses a common sense question. Could it be that there's something wrong with the way corruption perceptions are conventionally measured in the first place? It's like cooking. If the meat you use to make a stew is bad, it doesn't matter what exotic herbs you add to make it taste better. It will still taste bad. Global indices like the CPI have done a great public service by bringing attention to the problem of corruption. But their concept and measurement of corruption is problematic, even misleading. First of all, you should note that the CPI is a perception-based measure based on experts. But the survey is not done in-house. Rather, it is aggregated from existing third-party sources, which means that the CPI has no control over their methods. Second, the CPI gives a single corruption score to each country and does not distinguish among different types of corruption. This is like sausage making. Different meats are mushed into one sausage. And thirdly, the surveys used by CPI are run by organizations in rich countries and are usually with Western business experts as respondents. And finally, I would also point out that the wording of the surveys used by the CPI are often problematic. For example, the World Competitiveness Yearbook is one of the CPI's sources in 2016. It asks senior business leaders a single terms question. Bribery and corruption exist or do not exist? Another example is the Economist Intelligence Unit's country risk ratings, which asks, are there general abuses of public resources? So imagine if you were asked to answer this question for say, the US, China, or Nigeria. What would you say? Do you think your answer is valid or meaningful. So clearly there is room for improving questionnaire design. To address some of the preceding problems I described, in one chapter of my book, I piloted my own corruption perception index. Instead of asking country experts to rate corruption using one blanket question, I pose a series of stylized vignettes. And one example is this, inspired by a New York Times article. Major figures move back and forth between the public and private sector, and there are no laws forbidding this practice. How common do you think this type of scenario is in the country you're rating today? The advantage of using a vignette is that it ensures that expert raters are thinking about a similar scenario rather than imagining different concepts of corruption in their minds. At the same time, I tried to pick vignettes that represent a broader set of cases. And then I repeat these vignettes across the four categories of corruption I earlier introduced. I aggregate the results by the four categories and visualize them in this format. The total unbundled corruption index score is indicated at the top left in brackets. In the case of the United States, it's 20.8. On top of that, you can also see the composition of corruption distributed over the four categories. The U.S. has relatively low levels of petty theft, grand theft, and speed money, and the most dominant type of corruption, colored in orange, is access money. A comparison between China and the U.S. yields some interesting insights. In terms of total corruption score, whether it is in my index or the CPI, China is consistently rated as much more corrupt than the U.S. However, once unbundled, we see that China has specifically higher levels of petty theft, grand theft and speed money because it is still a developing country. On access money, however, the two countries are much closer. But whereas access money in the US today is primarily institutional, in China, it is enmeshed within personal networks and still involves bribes and illegal actions. What this tells us is that in fact, some rich countries do have corruption if not at least state capture and undue influence, except they exist in legalized and sophisticated forms.
Having revised the conventional wisdom about corruption and capitalism, we can now make sense of China's paradox of growth and corruption. The structure of corruption in China evolved in ways quite similar to the US. Consider data from prosecuted corruption cases from 1998 to 2014. Corruption with exchange, the black line, measures bribery. Corruption with theft includes embezzlement and misuse of public funds. As you can see, in 1998, there were many more cases of corruption with theft than with exchange. Back then in China, embezzlement and misuse of public funds were rampant because monitoring capacities were very weak. But by 2014, the patterns were reversed. Corruption with theft came sharply under control, or bribery exploded. The ability of Chinese politicians to collect big bribes is tied to their ability to promote growth, attract investments, build new projects, borrow and spend. Thus, this access money is not incompatible with growth promotion, but it has distorting side effects. Colluding politicians and capitalists prefer to channel investment into state-controlled, high-rent sector like real estate, leading to excessive investment, speculative bubbles, and imbalanced growth. As is well known, China faces a problem of mounting corporate and government debt, which is now erupting in the case of the Evergrande crisis. Therefore, to conclude, corruption doesn't always disappear as countries grow richer. Rather, it changes in quality from thuggery and theft to an excess money. Corruption is not necessarily only found in poor countries. Some rich countries do have corruption, but they are legalized and sophisticated in forms. And finally, China's paradox is not strange. It's actually a newcomer on an evolutionary path earlier taken by countries in the West. To conclude, let me be clear about what I do not argue. Unfortunately, in some media mentions and even scholarly reviews of my book, my argument has been misrepresented as corruption is beneficial. This is wrong. Corruption is never beneficial, just as steroids are not beneficial. And this is unless one is willing to damage your long-term health for the sake of growing muscles fast. I don't recommend doing so. My book makes a historical observation. This isn't about advocating corruption. It's just a statement of fact, a critique of corruption as much as it is a critique of capitalism. Corruption doesn't always disappear, rather it evolves in quality, and conventional measures have systematically failed to capture this evolution. One implication of my study is that one should be critical of conventional narratives about the rise of capitalism and measures of corruption. Just because they are mainstream doesn't mean they're necessarily correct. What are the lessons for developing countries hoping to escape poverty and corruption? I'm thrilled that next year, founded by Patrick, wrote a thoughtful review of my book. As it points out, one lesson is that we should unbundle corruption and tailor solutions to different types of corruption. All countries must fight growth damaging forms of corruption, such as embezzlement. There's no question about this. Access money is trickier. In the best case scenario, as we see in the Chinese and American Gilded Ages, access money was channeled toward growth promotion. But this was an unequal and risky form of growth. When problems blow up, nations will be tested on their ability to overcome a capitalist crisis and transition into a post-Gilded Age as we see in China today. Well, thank you very much. And I look forward to Patrick's questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuan. And uh, thanks for making time to join this conversation. Corruption is one of those topics that we in Africa spend a lot of time talking about um, for a number of reasons. Uh, obviously, uh, corruption uh, leads to a lot of underdevelopment, insecurity, etc. We know the literature around it. Um, different African countries have tried different solutions uh, to corruption. Some of these solutions advocated by scholars, multilateral agencies. We've tried the anti-corruption um, agencies. We've tried uh, transparency laws. We've tried Freedom of Information Act. Uh, we've tried different things, uh, but corruption continues to you know, get worse. Even as some of the countries um, ride up the GDP uh, ladder, you know, corruption seems to be persistent. Uh, 
Um, I'd like to go back a little bit, you know, to your first book, How China Escaped the Poverty Trap, um, and make a connection to the second book um, and ask the question, uh, I understand how China has moved, you know, with both, you know, having corruption and meritocracy, uh, kind of reading that, 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 that ladder. But the question then is, how did it all start? How, 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 did chi how was China able to um, ring out development even while still stuck within a very corrupt system? We understand um, the various theories around, you know, how co countries can emerge from corruption. There's the Big Bang theory, you know, something happens like a big war and then it forces the elites to think differently. But when, when we look at China, we can see that that happened, kind of happened, you know, with uh, Deng. Um, but I, I just wonder if you can unbundle that for us a little bit, um, what th that journey was like for China, and then we can mirror on top of it, the, the scenarios that we're, we're seeing in Africa. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, that is a thought-provoking set of comments, and I want to thank you in particular for connecting uh, China's Gilded Age to my first book. Thank you for reading both books, uh, How China Escaped the Poverty Trap. Um, you've, asked a, you've asked a very difficult question, um, one that, as you pointed out, many people have struggled to solve, which is what to do about persistent corruption in Africa. Uh, governments have tried various solutions and uh, nothing seems to work. I wanted to begin by saying that um, I'm very cautious about uh, advocating solutions and I want to portray it in this way. Um, all I'm going to say is I will extract some lessons from China, but these are not quick fixes. Right? I, I'm, I'm very cautious about um, recommending uh, some magical solution that people expect will eradicate the problem. But I think if we look at the experience of China, um, there are at least sort of two lessons that I think is useful to keep in mind. The first lesson is the concept that I introduce in one chapter of the Gilded Age, which is called transitional administrative institutions. And what this means is that China is well known economically for going for transitioning from a planned economy to a market economy, not by immediately having the full spectrum of perfect market institutions, but instead it began with partial market reforms um, and partial um, a hybrid of market and planned institutions. So an example is hybrid property rights. And then using these transitional economic institutions, it created buy-in for the reform process. It allowed the government time and experience to learn in a sense from an incremental experiment and then to move forward step by step. So this is in striking contrast to the standard prescriptions of first you must replicate the full suite of Weberian and perfect institutions from the West, right? And what I argue in my book is that if you look at the realm of administrative and governmental reforms, in fact, the same strategy was carried out. They were transitional administrative institutions. So if you look at my analysis, for instance, of how Chinese public employees were paid, their formal public salaries are very low and below subsistence. And this is a problem that cuts across all developing economies. When public servants are severely underpaid, then of course they have no choice but to extract bribes, to extort, or simply not come to work. As I show in that chapter, China had a transitional administrative institution whereby these bureaucrats receive a little bit of formal salary, but they had a profit sharing system where their fringe benefits were systematically packed to their ability to generate income both for the agency as well as the local government. This is not best practice by any World Bank or IMF standard, but it worked for the circumstances in China at an early stage of development. And then as local governments became richer, they had the resources and the capabilities to transition out of that initial stage. 
So I'm not recommending that Nigeria and countries in Africa just copy and paste whatever China did. I'm just saying that it's useful to think about the concept of transitional administrative institutions and ask what are the varieties that could manifest in Africa. So that's one. The second thing I would point out is that in all successful capitalist economies, whether it's China or the US, you'll find that the common trait is channeling the power of greed. Greed is something that we cannot eradicate. But how could you channel the power of greed so that it is channeled towards growth promotion at an initial stage of development rather than toward extortion, embezzlement, and stealing? And as I said, even in the best case scenario like China, where they were able to channel that greed toward growth promotion, it will produce distortions. And eventually there will be a crisis and countries will have to deal with it. So I want to warn against thinking that there's a quick fix that will solve all problems, eradicate corruption, and have no costs down the road. There's, there's no quick fix that I can think of. But these are the lessons I can draw from China's experience. Thank, thank you, thank you, Yuan. And my, my takeaway, every time I read your book, my takeaway uh, from your writing is that countries need to have a bit of confidence to experiment. You know, within the context of um, their, their 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 experience, and what I find in you know our work in Africa, you know, with different countries, is maybe because of the imbalance in power, um, where some of these countries rely on the multilateral agencies for a lot of their funding. Um, we tend to adopt uh, some of the uh, prescriptions which may not be right for um, our environment, um, you know, and maybe that's part of the, maybe that's part of the problem, I don't know. Um, but I, I have another question, you know, which is, in your experience, in your, in your research, have you seen countries move from, say, a predominance of access money to speed money or to grand theft? And what kind of triggers that move and how do these countries respond to deal with this new form um, of corruption or this new type of, this new more dominant form of corruption? Thank you so much, Patrick. I, I especially appreciate the point that you underscored about countries needing to have the confidence to experiment. And this is an important point for me, both analytically as well as normatively, because I grew up in Singapore, which is a post-colonial society. And, and that experience of post-colonialism um, has taught me that there is a lasting inequality between the developing and developed world. And this lasting inequality has led the people in the developing world with this entrenched assumption that their jobs is to catch up with the West. Right? We use the language of catch up, right? And, 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 and what this whole language of the divide and the catch up is means that it's, it's implicitly telling the developing countries that you always have a problem. You're not good enough, right? If only you did X, Y, and Z, and you caught up, you graduate, you look like the West, you'd be fine. And, and throughout both of my books, I try to challenge that assumption. And, and I want to encourage um, people from developing countries to use what you have. So this is one of the uh, phrases that I've used throughout my books and commentaries. Uh, we need to question the modern urban industrial bias that is embedded in all development discourse. And, and we need to actually look inward and look at what are the existing resources that developing countries already have. Those are the resources that one can meaningfully use to kickstart development. And, and to me, that is the most powerful lesson that comes out of China. When I present this in China, it often actually surprises people in China because they thought that the way to talk about the Chinese success story is to talk about the big infrastructure, the grand achievements that they've made. And what I try to explain is that 
What the developing countries really want to hear is an empowering message about using humble resources, the things that you already have to kickstart development. That is the message that is most empowering to people in developing countries. So I want to thank you for raising that point. Your other question about the reversal from access money to grant theft, off the top of my head, I can't think of a case, but I'll be happy to talk more if you can. I, I, I can't think of one because so far, the cases that I've examined have moved in the evolutionary path away from thuggery and theft toward access money, and therefore they became ca successful capitalist economy. Whether there were cases that regress, maybe they are, but I can't think of them off the top of my head. Um, Dan, if I can get one more question in before we go to the uh, questions in the comments. You know, so one of these uh, experimentations that I think uh, we should have the confidence to try is what I'm beginning to call a transparency and accountability rating system. You know, so the, the premise is because these African countries or developing countries rely a lot on loans and grants from the, from the donor countries, if the donor countries really want to help the developing countries exit corruption, shouldn't we have some kind of a transparency and accountability rating system that looks at um, certain measures um, that ensure that these countries put checks in place. And if those checks are not in place, then they lose access to the grants and the loans. And that that could be a way of at least dealing with the political corruption or the big, you know, uh, grant theft, you know, which some of these African uh, countries tend to struggle with. What's your first impression of that idea? That I think I would love to explore that in more depth. It sounds very promising to me. What I would point out is that I think it probably would be helpful to experiment that on a small scale, collect feedback and decide whether it's worth um, scaling upward. Um, the other thing I would point out is that, at least in my research, I often find that the best solutions um, are actually often already existent on the ground. It's just that we haven't discovered them. So are there, in fact, already indigenous ways in which local people in Nigeria have found ways to mitigate the harm of corruption? I'm not sure. I'm just throwing out this idea. The reason why I say this is that, as you know, in my first book, in my final chapter, I have an analysis about Nollywood in Nigeria. Right? And this is an amazing story of how a film industry just emerged from scratch out of nowhere in the 1990s um, because people were desperate. They wanted to make a living and they used what they have at the time to create this whole industry from scratch and it subsequently evolved into the scale that it is today. So um, from that particular analysis, one of the things I've learned is that I think when we approach development, instead of being, instead of having this top-down te technocratic approach where I sit here and I tell you what the solution is, we are much better off if we just go to the ground, observe and listen. Look at the solutions that people have already created because they are desperate. They have to survive, so they have to come up with solutions. And what we can do as experts, organizations and governments is that we can support these indigenous solutions in scaling up. And I think that that would be far more effective than, than, than come, sort of coming up with a set of solutions in a theoretical way. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Dan, I'll turn it over to you for some of the questions we have in the chat room. Great. Let me, let me start off with a question of my own for, for Yuan. Uh, often, you're obviously studying a topic that would be considered sensitive within China. Uh, however, we're often able to glean impressions of our work through conversations with scholars, officials, the media, etc. What has been the reaction to your, to your work from colleagues, I know you've done extensive field work in China. What has been the reaction to your work there? Um, I have been very fortunate to engage 
extensively with audiences in China and my work. It's a very rewarding, um, but also challenging experience. But the rewards are far greater than the challenges because number one, all of my work, as I tell my audiences in China, is, is really distilled from the stories that people have shared with me. I know about China only to the extent that people in China have taught me. So that engagement is super important to me. What I hope to give back to audiences in China is my interpretation. And this interpretation has, I think, at least um, a few important elements that may not be easily found in China. The first important element is the comparative perspective. Right? So often the analysis in China are carried out in, in a kind of bubble, but China is only thinking about China. And so, for example, in China's Gilded Age, I wanted to get people to go outside of that bubble and think about China in comparison with the United States. That's why it's called China's Gilded Age. And this is intellectually exciting for many reasons, because in the current Cold War climate, we often think of China and the U.S. as two polar opposites with nothing in common and nothing to, to say to each other. But by actually putting them on a parallel plane and comparing them both uh, historically as well as over time, what I hope to do is to get audiences in China to, to think outside this, this box of the clash of civilizations. So there is actually a Chinese, extensive Chinese review of China's Gilded Age in Chinese, and, and you can read about that. Uh, and one of the comments that I found striking was the reviewer's comment about reading the book to understand the times in which we live. And I was very touched by that comment because that's exactly one of the intellectual goals I um, hope to pursue. Um, I think Chinese audiences are more um, receptive to historical reasoning. So, so they're much more uh, receptive to wanting to think about things historically, as well as to think about what, what is the nature of the times in which we now live in the broader context of long-term evolution. So these are at least some of the very rewarding reactions that um, I've gotten um, from China. Thank you very much, Jan. I'm, I'm going to refer now to, to we have a, a number of questions in the Q&A uh, function here on Zoom. I would encourage our audience to, to keep adding those in. I will try to bundle some together and, and ask similar questions together. A number of people, uh, your book is, of course, primarily about China's Gilded Age, but a number of people asked about what, how your work shines light on the concept of what you, I think, have termed legal access money in the United States. What does your work, how does your work inform the way we think about access money in, in the United States, the way we think about legal and illegal forms of, of access money, and how we think about the concept of corruption? Oh, thank you very much for that. That's a very exciting set of questions. Um, the so in in my scholarship i i build on um a, a quite rich set of legal literature about access money in the united states and and the term they use is undue influence or influence paddling and so forth so that that literature has always existed but it has always been um, I would say quarantined in a special category and not actually brought into a broader discussion of corruption. So that when we talk about corruption, it's, it's basically extortion, embezzlement, petty bribery, problems of poor country. And we have been unwilling to acknowledge that can we bring developing and developed countries on an equal plane and talk about the common problems of human greed that we share, except express in different forms. So I think so. That's what I, I wanted to do. The, the literature is already there. All I'm doing is to bring all of it into an equal plane. Um, and I hope that one of the takeaways that readers might take from the book, um, and I'm very gratified by the comment, is that if we think about the problems of capitalism populism and democratic backlash in rich democracies today, you can't have that conversation without talking about access money. Right? So 
very often I read commentaries about we'll fix capitalism, this and that, and this and that. I never hear the word corruption mentioned, almost never. And I think we need to mention that word. If we don't want to use the word corruption, then we can use the word access money, which is more accurate. Uh, we need to recognize that what has gone wrong with democracy is that what initially was a form of democratic representation has been usurped and it has been taken to the extreme in terms of the unequal representation of interests. So I hope that there will be more attention on this issue, which is relevant not only for understanding China, but also for understanding the crisis of democracy in Western democracies today. Thank you, Yuan. Um, Patrick, anything you wanted to add on that particular question? No, no, I think there's some great questions in the chat room. I was going through the chat room and I think we should spend some time getting to them. All right, so let me ask the next question and invite both of you to respond. Maybe Yen, we can start with you and, and Patrick, uh, uh, please do follow up Yen with your thoughts. So somebody asked uh, very directly, what, what countries are role models for combating corruption? And I, I would add that my own editorial comment or is the lesson from your book, Yuan, and your experience, Patrick, that in fact, there are not perfect role models and we should not be looking for perfect role models, but rather we need to consider the unique economic, political, cultural circumstances of each country to find solutions. And what might that mean for China, for Nigeria, or for other countries that, that both of you uh, observe? Wow, that's an excellent question. Um, very insightful. I would say that my message has always been that we need to learn selectively. And I would say that in, in the development field in the past decades, one of the core problems is that people basically adulate, uh, adulated, uh, admired and emulated whichever country is rich and successful. And they were not being critical of the fact that, well, there's no country that is a perfect role model, as you put it then. Um, every country, even if rich and powerful, has its certain set of problems. So when we learn, we have to learn selectively. We have to decide what is it that is worth learning and what is it that is not worth learning. And in this way, when crises do happen and what used to be successful appears to become a failure, we don't just then throw away everything that we've learned. We keep doing this, right? If you think about how people used to emulate East Asia and then after 1997, they thought it was a basket case, how people used to emulate the US and then threw away that emulation after the 2008 financial crisis. Um, by learning selectively, I think we can be much more objective and also the lessons will endure beyond the rise and fall of nations. Thank you. Yeah, and just to echo that point, um, increasingly in, in the work I do, I find that um, you know, I'm, I'm emphasizing more that countries need to be more confident, you know, to look at their problems, set it within the political economy that they operate in and look for answers. And the idea of, you know, a copy and paste or a model that has worked in half of the world must work in the other half. Um, I haven't found that to be the case, you know, so it's to look within, uh, look at the incentives, you know, what's the incentives for the different players, be that the elite players or the non-elite players and figure out what we're currently doing, you know, that can help plug um, where the leakages are coming from. Um, there could be room to work with external factors, you know, to get some of those actions going, um, but it's increasingly to rely more on um, our the, the realities of our political economy, you know, to come up with solutions that work for us. Great, I, I, think, I, I, think, I'm, I think our audience is hearing you clearly that, that each uh, country's circumstances is unique and it is also valuable to experiment with, with what may have worked in other places based on, based on local circumstances. There, there are a number of uh, questions, by the way, there's, there's 32 questions in, in the Q&A. Um, and obviously we're not gonna get, get to all those. So I apologize in advance for those who, who may not have their questions answered. I would say that the recording of this will be on our YouTube channel um, by, by early next week. Um, a couple people asked how, 
your work, Yuan, has influenced uh, how it sheds light on Xi Jinping's corruption campaign and what your study tells us about the way that that campaign is carried out, the implications of it, and uh, how to measure its success or failure. And I would um, also invite Patrick to comment on how uh, Yuan's book would inform his views of various corruption actions, anti-corruption actions in Nigeria or other places he has, he has observed and studied. Thank you for that question. I do have a chapter uh, in my book examining the anti-corruption campaign. On this campaign, I'm often asked, is this campaign A, just an excuse to purge enemies, or B, a genuine effort at uh, institutional reform? And the answer is, it doesn't have to be either or, it's all of the above, right? Of course, as an anti-corruption campaign, it's part of the elite politics and power struggles in China at the highest level. But there is also at the same time, a genuine realization that corruption has rich crisis proportions in China, not of the embezzlement and extortion type, as I explained, but um, of these access money variety. Um, and so both motivations are going on at the same time. If you look at the way in which the campaign has been carried out, it has largely been in the form of a top-down investigation focused on individuals. And therefore, its limitations are that it has been very effective at scaring officials into not being corrupt, but it is less effective in terms of tackling the root causes of corruption. Some of the root causes of corruption in China include the fact that the state has a lot of power over the economy. And, and when politicians have a lot of power over the economy, there will be constant demand for the favors they're able to dole out. So this fundamental issue has not been resolved. Instead, the campaign has focused on arresting as, as many corrupt officials as possible. And the numbers are staggering. By 2018, 1.5 million officials are disciplined. Right? And if you look at the most recent documentary issued by CCTV about the anti-corruption campaign, you can see how the focus of that documentary is about, look at these bad individuals. Look at these bad people their bad mindsets, their lack of ideals, and how we're going to get them. What the documentary doesn't talk about is how is corruption in China an institutional problem? How is it embedded in the political economy? Because that is the reality that the party doesn't want to talk about. Instead, it wants to frame anti-corruption as they're bad people and we are going to get them. So that therefore limits the enduring impact of anti-corruption. An interesting question. Uh, I read probably in Project Syndicate uh, that uh, of all the people that she's, uh, you know, arrested in his anti-corruption push, none of them uh, is from the region that he used to he used to govern, and none of them are any members of his princely. You know, so the idea is that it's a, it's a witch hunt. But I say it's good because once you get on that tiger, it, it becomes difficult to get off the tiger. The same witch hunt could catch you know, other politicians. But the second question you asked is, what have we learned from uh, Yuan's book uh, that could help in the work we're doing? I think it's really that corruption is not unidimensional. You know, you can't score corruption with just one point. It, it gives us a framework to unbundle corruption, even within countries in Africa, but within the countries, as between countries in Africa and within the countries. And an understanding of th that different typology of corruption informs how you approach it. So if you're dealing predominantly with a grand theft, the approach becomes different from if you're dealing with access money. In the past, it was one score on the corruption perception index, which clouded um, all of this deeper understanding of the ramifications of corruption in the different countries. Thank you, Patrick. And yeah, it looks like we have time for, for one more question. So I'll have, to, I'll have to make this last one. And I, I found this part of your book uh, fascinating, Yen, and, and I'd be very interested to hear Patrick's thoughts. 
Can you talk a bit about your research methods? Uh, you come to these, you, you've shared with us your conclusions as is appropriate in a, in a 25 minute presentation, but you also employed some um, innovative qualitative and quantitative methods. Can you say uh, a few takeaways uh, about your research methods and how they influence your findings? And uh, Patrick, again, I would invite you to share either in your personal experience or on next year, new, new ways, new methods of looking at this problem that have, have produced light. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, Dan, for giving me a nerdy moment to talk about research methods. I'm right with you, Jan. I'm yeah. right with you. <laughs> um, I teach a graduate seminar on mixed methods, so this is very close to my heart. Uh, I apply mixed methods across all of my books. By mixed methods, I mean combining qualitative with quantitative methods. So I do few work, interviews, and then I also collect data and test them the way social scientists conventionally do. And my message as someone who employs mixed methods is that particularly if you are studying the developing world, whether it's China or Nigeria, you have to have a strong element of qualitative research because the questions are not well defined. The problems are not well understood you can skip the process possibly in the united states because data is abundant because the rules of the game are clear and you have an ample literature to build upon so you can sit in your office and start with a hypothesis you cannot do that in china and nigeria where the rules of the game are mostly informal and so i do believe that it's beholden on us as researchers to be faithful to real stories on the ground and so that is why in my research, I always start with qualitative research, which helps me to listen to people, observe them. And then it helps me to discover questions and answers I couldn't possibly come up on my own. Actually, the arguments in my book are all from the field. And what I do as a social scientist is simply to collect these stories and then retell them in a social scientific way. The process is pretty similar. Um, so it's, uh, you know, typically to get a bunch of people in the room and, you know, do like a focus group and, you know, get, get to understand the subject a bit better and then use that to shape up uh, the study instrument. And one of the things uh, that we're beginning to experiment with is the vignettes um, that you, you uh, used in her book, you know, versus asking uh, direct questions that could be misinterpreted, but creating um, like case questions uh, that get people to say or, 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 or mark up um, what they're really thinking and gives you deeper insights into, into what the, the issues are. You're muted, Dan. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, I see that we only have a minute left before the witching hour. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you, Yen, for your, your book, your writings, for sharing your insights, Patrick, uh, for your work and for engaging in this conversation. I think it's been a fascinating discussion. We had uh, very robust uh, attendance and engagement. As I said, I apologize to those in the audience who, who didn't have their questions answered. Uh, we will be sending out an email to everyone who registered with a link to this program on YouTube when that comes out. And we appreciate your attendance. Again, Yen and Patrick, thank you so much for facilitating this conversation today and, and for your meaningful work. We appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Yen. Mm -hmm. And thanks to everyone. Thank you.